Anyway, thank you everyone very much for joining us. Uh, I'm going to give a rundown for probably about 30 minutes, maybe a little bit longer, on our report on whether or not bigger is better in renewable energy, looking at the economies of scale of wind and solar, um, sharing some of our findings and conclusions. Um, we will be taking questions along the way uh, for clarifying questions, but also save some time at the end for some questions as well. Our goal is to go about an hour and finish at 1 o'clock Central to Eastern. Uh, translate to whatever time zone you're from. <clears throat> Apologies in advance for my voice. I've been nursing an excellent cold over the past two to three days. I have a lot more of my voice than I did on Friday, so I'm very pleased about the scheduling for this. Um, but apologies, because I know I will be less understandable than usual, although hopefully still coherent. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just jump in, and I'm going to do so by talking, first of all, about what I like to call the history of big things. So we have sort of a fascination in the United States with things that are large. I don't know that there actually is a big gulp the size that this man is holding uh, and that it's not a parody. Um, but we do have um, a fascination with large things, and you see that in many different uh, shapes and forms, whether it's the world's largest ball of twine, the world's biggest uh, something or other, the Guinness Book of World Records, lots of different ways um, that we have this sort of cultural fascination. But when it comes to wind and solar uh, power production, I think that it's less to do with that, but all more to do with a history in our energy system of taking advantage of what are called economies of scale. Um, this is a little less understandable than I would wish from uh, at first glance, but it is sort of the basis behind which a lot of economies of scale and materials use has led to our uh, production of power from large power plants. On the left, you have a cu uh, cube uh, with each side length one. On the right, a cube with each side length two. And what's important is the comparison on the bottom, which is that when you um, multiply by four, the surface area that you need to create this container uh, by going from the smaller to the larger one, you actually increase the volume by eight times. And so the idea here is that let's say you're building a huge container in order to hold water to, uh, that will be used to send the water to, gen to be heated for steam to generate power uh, by turning a steam turbine or many other, or simply the, the, the building of the power plant itself, there are economies of scale from being larger in size. And it's economies of scale like this that drove the, the rapid rise in power plant efficiency over the early years uh, in our electricity system. That from the 1900s through, uh, early 1900s through the uh, late 50s, um, we had a steady increase in both the maximum efficiency and average efficiency of power plants uh, that were on the power system. Um, but we reached the limits of that um, expansion uh, to scale, that uh, advantages of size and scale um, at about that time. And as you may recall from our history, uh, by the late 60s, early 70s, we had a few other uh, issues, for, uh, both from inflation uh, and also from uh, the first, uh, after the oil crisis, or serious decrease at the rate of which we were using electricity that led to a lot of economic issues for utility companies. But a lot of those problems were driven by the fact that they had reached the end of much of the scale economies um, uh, uh, in traditional power generation at that time. Um, the other thing that was going on, uh, you know, that, or that has been sort of driving this sort of back to that cultural issue for a moment, um, has been this kind of question about um, uh, what's the scale that we need in order to reach 100% renewable energy whether it's for our country or for the whole world. And so uh, in the whole world, uh, they, they, some folks have thrown out the idea that about 43,000 square miles of land would be sufficient to put up solar to provide all of the primary energy input that we need for our world economy. And I just thought it might be interesting to take a moment uh, to put that in context and to guess which state out of the United States is about 43,000 square miles. You can put your answer in the chat. Uh, if you're um, able to find that chat thing, if, you, if you've got that webinar control panel up, the chat option is at the bottom. You should be able to go in there and just throw in your answer. Um, but go ahead and just take a guess as to which state it is that most closely corresponds with that 43,000 square miles that we would need if we were to use solar to power the entire world, ignoring, of course, for the technical limitations of trying to do so uh, from one particular location. I'm not seeing anybody participating in the chat, which either suggests to me that our chat feature is too challenging to find or that nobody is able to hear me or that nobody has a guess. <laughs> 
I'm going to give it a few more seconds to see if there's a technical issue on our end that we can fix, but then I'll go ahead and move on. John, it looks like they're coming through in the questions section um, ah, on the very control good. panel. Very good. I will open the questions so that I may see the answers. It's going to actually, I think, short out my presentation for a second in the slide so I can open that tab and keep it open. Perfect. Um, I've got one disadvantage with my uh, uh, maximizing the screen in order to give the presentation, which is that it was blocking out my control panel. So apologies. Okay, so we have lots of good guesses in here. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Um, probably some people who are doing some guesses with the Internet. We've got a lot of Louisiana in there. Thank you, folks. Um, either you're excellent guessers or you, like me, looked it up in order to do something like this presentation. Um, and the answer is Louisiana. Um, and you might have seen, actually, this next slide here, um, which shows uh, this was map circulated probably about five, six years ago. was around a lot when there was a lot of talk about um, solar, concentrating solar in particular, where they use mirrors to focus sunlight uh, to create the heat to generate electricity. And um, uh, the, the different squares there show the amount of land area required to provide solar for, uh, I believe that was for Germany, for the entire EU25, or for the world uh, out in the Sahara Desert. So there's been this, uh, you know, the summary of this is essentially there's been this both fascination with big things, you know, kind of as represented by this chart when we knew that we would never be getting solar uh, from that one particular square area of the world, uh, but also have been some uh, some real economic and uh, materials basis for that fascination. So let's dive in a little bit onto our first renewable energy technology of wind and talk a little bit about how that's played out in practice. Um, and the first thing is that there are surprising savings in smallness for wind power. This chart uh, came from the Wind Technologies Market Report uh, about five years ago and sh was a real surprise, frankly, when I saw it. Um, what you'll yeah, see in the sorry to bother you. Your presentation is out. Ah. Apologies for the technical challenges that I am fa facing here trying to get this. Nick, if you can confirm in a second here that it is showing again. Yep, you're good. Very good. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, what this chart here from the Wind Technologies Market Report shows, as I was saying, is the average cost per kilowatt um, for installing wind power projects installed between 2007 and 2009. And what you might find surprising, like I found surprising, was that rather than sort of a gradual step down from smallest to largest, you actually found a sweet spot in terms of the cost per kilowatt of projects at 5 to 20 megawatts, uh, which I found very surprising and unexpected. And at the time, there wasn't actually a lot of a, a very good understanding of this, and it was thought, oh, well, this could also be an aberration of the data. And so let me run you through a little bit of the data that is from more recent years uh, to give us a sense. So uh, that data, again, was from 2007 to 2009. Um, the data from projects installed in 2011 kind of conforms back to what we would expect, that we see this sort of gradual decrease over time. Uh, this next chart here actually shows you all of the years between 2011 and 2015, um, and they sort of go in color order. So if you go from blue in 2011, then green, yellow, orange, red, if you think about the colors of the rainbow, you can see that the cost was generally decreasing, although it was also increasing on the small end. Um, and so, so a couple of interesting things going on there that I think are worth exploring. So if you just took the 2011 data and kind of slid it down to represent the fact that as uh, component costs, materials costs were falling in this time period, especially the cost of steel, for example, um, that the cost of most wind projects would, would, was coming down. And you can see that for every size project except the very smallest wind projects, the cost was coming down. And the, the really only two outliers are that the very largest projects got less expensive by a little more than we would expect just by migrating that 2011 data down to 2015, and the very smallest projects got enormously more expensive. Um, and, and so we found, I kind of have this interesting uh, evidence here in terms of the cost to install these projects that, um, generally speaking, there are advantages to scale, but almost all of those advantages are captured in the moving from a project that consists of one to two turbines to projects that consist of um, a handful of turbines, moving from less than five megawatts to about five to 20 megawatts. Um, there still are savings in economies of scale in building those larger projects, uh, but they're much less significant than the savings on the small end. 
Uh, and, and it's good to make a note here, uh, as we're going to jump into this conversation, that these are the costs not including the cost to deliver that energy. So there's no transmission or interconnection costs included in this. This is simply the cost to build that wind project. But let's get into that question then of kind of the important issue of delivery and sort of some of the hidden benefits of local generation when we talk about wind power. So uh, this table that I'm going to show you here is, is what I like to call wind versus wires, which looks at the relative cost of getting wind power from far away. Because the issue, of course, is not that we just want to generate renewables, but that they actually can be delivered to a place we can use them. And so on the left side here, you'll look, we'll be showing in a second the relative increase in wind speed you would need to overcome uh, the distance that you would have to travel on transmission. Uh, I'm counting both transmission losses and the cost to build transmission lines. So there will be some cases in which we may already have transmission capacity available. That's particularly true of smaller wind power projects. But by and large, especially in the Midwest, where we've really tapped a lot of our resource, we're talking about building new transmission. And so what we find here is that there's kind of uh, a trend here that um, as the distance increases, you need a, 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 a step up in the increase in the wind speed in order to compensate. So I've bolded a few of the numbers there. For example, at about 250 miles from where your large load is that you're going to serve with your wind power project, uh, it would take an increase in wind speed of about 15% to offset that distance in terms of the cost of the transmission. Uh, at about 500 miles, that's closer to 30% increase in wind speed that you would need to offset. At 750 miles, it's about 45%, maybe a little bit more. Um, and at 1,000 miles, you would need almost a 60% better wind resource. Um, now, this is kind of abstract because we're talking about relative percentages here in terms of wind speed. Um, but you can kind of see here that we have, uh, for very good, very windy regimes, uh, that you would be able to offset a fairly significant distance. So let's look at that in practice. Here's a map um, that looks at five different cities, and the colors here will tell you, and I apologize if anyone's red, green, colorblind, because red and green are very good for illust illustrations involving sort of stop and go, uh, but, but may be challenging to see this particular chart. Um, the, the, what we're looking at here is what, uh, whether or not it would be more cost effective or less cost effective to get power from a wind project that was located very close to load versus um, from far away and take it with a grain of salt that, of course, at these urban locations, you're not going to build a wind power project right at load. Um, uh, you would have to build it at some distance away at a minimum simply to get a, a good wind resource. But what you can see, for example, is that for Minneapolis, it makes a lot of sense to get wind power from South Dakota uh, if you're simply considering the basis of whether or not uh, the wind speed versus the transmission cost is, is the end of your calculus about wind power production. For New York City, on the other hand, uh, it's not cost effective uh, either to try to get wind from Iowa or from relatively windy places in Indiana simply because the distances are too great to make up uh, for that transmission cost. So I, I broke out a couple of examples here. Here's Chicago. You can see that for Chicago, getting wind power from Iowa um, would be relatively cost effective compared to the cost of transmission. On the other hand, going all the way to South Dakota uh, might be prohibitive. It's, it's, it's kind of on the margins. Um, and then, of course, here's New York City again, where you can see that um, obviously these lines don't correspond to the actual route of transmission, uh, but simply illustrative of the distance, uh, that the transmission cost would outweigh the wind speed benefits of trying to bring in wind from the Midwest. So, uh, in short, what we find is that there definitely are economies of scale to the facility, the wind power facility that we build, um, but it does matter where we place that facility. And, of course, the larger the facility, the more remote it is likely to have to be um, as compared to building projects closer to load that would be smaller. And so there's more to just the size of the project that matters in determining the economies of scale of wind power. There's also a second part of this uh, that's important, which is the price that really matters is the price of the competition. So in some ways, we're not really comparing the smallest wind power projects to the largest ones, because it may be that they don't actually compete against the same price. And in fact, that, that may be the truth. So this looks at um, the 20-year levelized cost of projects based on the most recent data of the cost per kilowatt from the Wind Technologies Market Report, and converts that into a cost per kilowatt hour assuming a similar capacity factor between these different projects. I believe it was 35%. I apologize for not having that in here. Um, but what we 
um, find is that you know your larger projects are almost certainly going to be connected at the wholesale level. And if we look at, for example, the annual average day ahead wholesale price for the PJM market in 2015, we find that most of the large scale wind is, is going to be competitive with that price. And that the small scale wind, the under five megawatt projects, would not be competitive even with utility scale turbines. But what we have seen, at least in a couple places in the Midwest, is distributed wind projects, so just a couple of turbines, maybe combined with a solar project. Um, some people are calling these solar wind hybrids. Um, these projects are um, trying to get interconnected under PURPA as a qualifying facility. They're asking for an avoided cost that includes not just the fuel cost and the capacity cost that is normally offset when you try to get this kind of calculation done through the state commission or a negotiation with the utility, but they're saying, hey, we're also avoiding transmission costs because these projects are small enough they can connect right next to a utility substation. And what they're finding is that, in fact, they can get a higher price than this wholesale price that you might find on the general market because of avoiding that transmission cost. And so uh, while it may be that these smaller projects are significantly more expensive on a per kilowatt hour or on a per kilowatt basis for installing and on a per kilowatt hour basis for the levelized cost of electricity, because they avoid the delivery charges that some of these larger projects might in terms of connecting to the transmission system, they might actually be able to be competitive in a way uh, that the larger projects would not be able to be simply because they can't get uh, to that location. So it's sort of like the real estate market, location, location, location is what matters. And it turns out that in the wind market, it may be that these smaller projects, maybe combined with some solar, uh, can be competitive with the larger projects on the, on the, on the basis of competing at a different price at a different price point because they're able to connect at a distributed level. So that kind of covers the scope for wind power. I want to turn to solar power, but we're going to kind of follow the same thread here in terms of looking at the cost per kilowatt uh, in terms of the economies of scale to produce the electricity, and then also this question of delivery, which I think is really the more important question when we want to decide how it is that we want to compare small scale to large scale. And in fact, in the end, I think we'll find that um, that comparison uh, makes less sense than I think it, uh, that it has in the past. So once again, we're going to start with this basic chart looking at the installed cost for solar. So similar to the first chart we saw with the wind power, we're looking at the cost per watt installed for solar power projects from the residential scale on the far left all the way up to the largest utility scale projects. And the real surprise here Unlike with the wind power projects where we found that the first data we looked at from 07 to 09 really didn't fit with our concept of economies of scale, the solar stuff fits really well, except that last bar on the right, where we find that the largest solar projects are quite a bit more expensive than the ones just to the left that are between 20 and 100 megawatts, many of which may be installed in a more distributed fashion. Um, and, what, and, and the reason behind that is not entirely clear but likely has to do with the fact that these largest projects uh, require specialized permitting, uh, may involve negotiations over the use of public lands, there might be some issues about interconnection or uh, negotiating the development of transmission capacity that extends out the life of the project much longer, uh, specialized finance costs for raising the amount of capital that are required for these large projects. There are a lot of different factors. But the important thing is that we already find, even when we simply look at the cost to install and, del and deliver power from these projects, that the largest PV projects are more expensive than ones that are smaller. Now, that, this comparison on just sort of the cost per watt doesn't accurately capture uh, the whole picture because, of course, what we want to compare is the cost to actually deliver electricity uh, or produce electricity. So the second chart here focuses on um, the cost per kilowatt hour. And the significant difference between the prior chart and this one is that we've um, given a 30% benefit to the largest scale projects on the assumption that their capital costs are actually for tracking. Um, these are ground mounted systems that have trackers that will have higher per kilowatt hour output uh, per watt um, than the small projects which are likely on rooftops uh, and at a fixed tilt. So you can see here that the economies of scale are even more dramatic um, at the large end than at the small end. Uh, but there's still a fairly significant penalty for the largest scale solar projects. Now, once we've covered that, and, you know, so we've come to a similar conclusion uh, with solar that with, as we have with wind, that building larger scale things does mean uh, that, you know, were these projects located at a similar position on the grid and selling into the same market, the larger would be the more competitive. Uh, but what we find is that, again, 
uh, it's sort of an apples to oranges comparison that we really need to be looking at the price at the point of delivery. So for example, um, on the, I like to start on the right side of this chart. You have the largest um, solar projects in California, for example, will be compared to what's called the California market price referent, which is the comparable cost to build um, a natural gas fired power plant. And you find that most of those solar large scale power projects um, come in less than that price, even the very largest ones um, that have a kind of price penalty, but the price advantage is actually fairly significant for the projects anywhere between 5 and 100 megawatts. Um, you know, and, and what you'll find too is that even though I don't have that line on this chart, if you remember that line from the PGM wholesale uh, day ahead market price that we used for comparison to wind, uh, that some of those solar projects are even pretty close to that price um, uh, in terms of that uh, uh, their per kilowatt hour uh, production cost. Um, we also have, for example, the 5 to 10 megawatt solar could compete, for example, with the industrial retail price. That you might have industrial customers who have some significant land around their factory uh, where solar could provide a, 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 an edge uh, against their retail price. Um, you have uh, to the left of that um, the, a lot of commercial scale rooftop solar projects being competitive with the commercial retail price for electricity. Uh, and then on the far left, the fact that residential solar projects are competitive with the residential retail price. So I think the takeaway here is that it really matters what, at where it is that you're trying to deliver the electricity and, and what your competing price is. And that com comparing the largest scale solar to the small scale solar doesn't make sense. What we need to do is compare small scale stuff to its, co its competition, which is the retail prices, and the large scale stuff things to the wholesale market, which is what they compete with. Another thing that's important to talk about in this context when we talk about whether or not bigger is better. So we've kind of knocked out the myth, I think, that the largest scale solar and wind are the most cost effective because unfortunately that's not really the most accurate comparison. It's not about big wind versus small wind or big solar versus small solar, but rather what do these respective sizes compete with in the market. The second issue that we've dealt with in this question of economies of scale is which one is going to get us to some goal of lots of renewables faster. So whether you're motivated by climate change and this notion that renewable energy is one of the fastest ways to solve that problem, or you're motivated by the development of the renewable energy industry, or you simply love the idea that we're going to get solar everywhere, there has been this notion that the way that we get to the big amounts faster is by building it in really big chunks. Five years ago, this was especially prevalent in solar where we talked about the difference between concentrating solar power, where they would use these parabolic mirrors to focus sunlight on a, on a, on a fluid that would get heated to two or 300 or 400 degrees. That would be used then in a sort of traditional power generation format where that heat would be used to heat water, create steam, turn turbines, generate electricity. Um, these projects were enormous. They were the size of traditional power plants in terms of capacity, 500 megawatts, for example, um, and they were going to generate electricity that would be um, very competitive. Um, on the other hand, you know, we were looking at solar PV projects that were mostly on residential or commercial rooftops at the time, and folks argued, well, that you know, that those big projects were a much more cost-effective way to get our solar deployments than the small-scale stuff. So this next chart is kind of indicative of that, how that conversation was taking place, like say back in 2010 or 2009 when the price was relatively comparable. And we can see that over time we've, there's been quite a divergence, that in fact um, we went from a time where PV, solar PV and concentrating solar uh, thermal power were fairly price equivalent to now quite a divergence, that PV has become quite a lot cheaper. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that in terms of market deployment, that simply, you know, we install a new solar array in this country every approximately 60 seconds. That only not only allows for the mass production of the panels, but a lot of learning and reducing the soft costs uh, of that installation or even the other hardware costs. <coughs> Excuse me. Whereas concentrating solar power plants are built uh, one at a time and relatively slowly, and there's not as much opportunity for cost reductions as a result. Now, uh, one caveat here, of course, is that some of these concentrating solar projects uh, come with energy storage, which some of these smaller solar projects do not. Um, but as you can see on a per kilowatt hour basis, 
uh, solar PV is quite a bit less expensive at this point than concentrating solar power. Uh, once again, however, we're talking about in this chart comparing large solar PV to small or to, to large concentrating solar thermal power. Rooftop solar shouldn't even be factored into this discussion because it competes at a very different level at the retail level. Another way to look at this then is not just in terms of the cost to build the big stuff, but which is going to get us to our end goal faster. And for that, we can look to a comparison between Germany and the United States. In particular, I looked at uh, the two countries in a similar five-year period. So it was after they ha each had, I think, about 3,000 megawatts of solar installed when they reached that threshold. So for Germany, that was prior to 2007. And in the US, it was prior to 2011. And then I looked at the subsequent five years. And what I found was that essentially the two markets grew by about the same amount. In Germany, it was 22 gigawatts. And in the United States, it was 23 gigawatts. But what was different about them is that Germany used its feed-in tariff program to provide incentives all across the different, excuse me, all across the different size scales for development. So they had lots of rooftop uh, residential and commercial installations in particular and some larger projects, but not very many. In the United States, we had a fairly wide range of development, anywhere from rooftop solar on homes up to utility scale solar. So in Germany, three fully three quarters of the solar they installed was under 500 kilowatts. And in the United States, only about 42% was smaller than a megawatt. So quite a different spread in terms of the size of the projects. And yet they both got to about the same amount in the same five year period. And what that tells me is that it's not really about the size of the chunk that you install for solar, it's about how well your policy allows for that market to develop in general and how much you can uh, iterate over that time frame. And the Germans have been very successful at iterating and of course then driving down the cost of solar. Uh, and that's actually a figure that both gives me a hope and also makes me wonder what it is that we could do better in our market. So this chart here looks at um, the total market size for solar in five different countries as indicated in the red uh, with the little plus signs. And then it looks at both the installed prices for distributed solar, both residential and small non-residential. And what you can see is that if you just looked at the countries, the US, Japan, and Germany, what you would see is, oh, as the market grows, these prices come down, which offers a lot of optimism for the US. On the other hand, if you look to the right side of the chart, both Australia and France have smaller solar markets than the United States as of the time of making this chart. Uh, are, are from the data uh, from the data period of this chart, which is a little bit old because the U.S. has more than 12 gigawatts installed at this point. Um, but you have, uh, or sorry, no, actually this is recent because the 12 gigawatts is just uh, distributed solar, not, and not counting uh, the capacity of utility scale solar. Uh, so we sort of have this disturbing notion that in other countries they've been much more successful at driving the installed costs down uh, than we have in the United States. So I, I don't want to delve too deeply into that because it gets away from the economies of scale discussion um, uh, into some issues about soft costs and customer acquisition and many of the issues that the solar industry faces in the US, uh, as well as the question about policy design using the tax credit market as opposed to in Germany or Japan or other countries, a feed-in tariff structure. Um, but we clearly, uh, the, I, I like to use this chart as a sense of optimism that we can drive down the price of distributed solar the more that we do it. And if, for example, in the US, we had employed more distributed solar like Germany had as opposed to more utility scale solar, I wonder if we might have been more successful at driving that cost down. Um, so there's some a lot of food for thought in this chart, um, but I think mostly for me, some optimism about where the costs in our market may go. Um, to just share that information in another way, if you looked at that chart we have from earlier, about the cost per watt for solar installations in the United States, and you put in and replaced uh, uh, with the German costs from that previous chart uh, for the left four bars here, you can see just how much less expensive solar installations are in Germany, that not only are their small solar prices far lower than they are in the United States for distributed solar, but they're also lower than for any other size installation that we do in this country, including utility scale solar. So we certainly have some opportunity to drive down the prices uh, on solar, uh, even though they're installing with the same panels uh, that come from the same places. That you know the, the panels have largely become a commodity. We have a lot of opportunity to continue driving down the costs. So 
what I want to wrap up here with is this conversation about the bottom line. Um, we know that the, there are economies of scale in generating electricity from wind and solar, but they don't necessarily overcome this notion of delivery costs. You know, think about Amazon, for example. Would you rather uh, get free delivery to your doorstep, or would it, or would you rather take free delivery to their distribution center, where you now have to go pick up the uh, uh, the item in question yourself? Um, the electricity markets are structured in such a way as to impose those delivery costs, whether that's new transmission line or simply access to transmission facilities, and small-scale projects can avoid some of those costs as well as offering other benefits, uh, as you might see in a conversation about the value of solar. So what is the bottom line here? Why are we having a debate about big versus small when it's really not about big versus small, but instead about what each of these competes with respectively? And the bottom line is that uh, these different uh, questions of cost have some significant impact on the utilities uh, that will be hosting these solar arrays on the grids that they operate. So this is um, a couple of a series of charts here um, from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory a study that they did a couple of years ago, and I apologize for not having the attribution on the chart. Uh, there's three parts to it. The first one is looking at what happens when we get to 10% customer-owned solar. What would be the impact on customer bills? And the conclusion, both from a modeled Southwest utility, which I apparently have misspelled and will correct in the uh, version of this uh, presentation that we will publish uh, for you to review and, and to receive by email, uh, and a Northeastern utility. And they found that for either kind of utility, that the, the customer rate impact of reaching 10% solar is relatively small. I mean, 2.5% is less than most of the annual increases, rate increases that we've seen for electricity bills at the retail level over the last decade. Um, so a relatively small impact for reaching a significant penetration of customer-owned solar. On the other hand, the impact of util for utility earnings for these investor-owned utilities is much more significant. A decrease in earnings between 8 and 15 percent between the two different utilities, and a return on equity impact of between minus 3 percent and minus 8 percent. So when we ask this question about who cares about this notion between big and small, the answer is the utilities care, because what we're talking about here is not so much a question about um, whether or not bigger is better or smaller is better, but about who's going to win and who's going to benefit. And I'll, I'll turn to Samuel Insull, who is uh, Thomas Edison's right-hand man in the creation of his utility empire in the early 20th century, um, for some uh, uh, understanding of what, how it is that utilities view this problem. Uh, you know, it was at that time that Insull, working together with progressive politicians, created the public state regulation system for public utilities. And the idea was that for, for these utility companies was that this regulation would provide them protection, protection from competition. And that the issue that we have now is not that big is better than small in terms of the cost to the customer, but that small is competition for the big in a way that it really hasn't been before. And we not only have some of the form, sort of the formal structures and the market control of large utility companies uh, that we confront between in this big versus small conversation, but also a cultural difference. You know, I'm, I was at a uh, convening in Tucson a couple of years ago and giving a presentation, and well, representative of the utilities stood up and kind of explained um, that you know, kind of their perspective on distributed renewable energy like solar. And as part of that, he kind of mentioned how the conservative nature of a utility company and how they come to work each day to do what they did the day before. And this is at a time when innovation is exploding throughout the electricity industry, whether it's smartphone controlled smart thermostats or rooftop solar or batteries in solar or electric vehicles. Um, we simply have utility companies with you know, kind of a cultural uh, conservatism that isn't very well prepared to deal with all these changes. And there are some other changes too that I haven't been able to manage. Uh, for example, some remarkable changes in the amount of sales uh, of electricity. So in the past few years, uh, we've actually seen a peak in electricity sales, and I'm going to just open this somewhere on this chart, which I'll show in a second, is the year in which electricity sales last peaked. And I'm curious if folks can go to the chat again and go ahead and put in their guess as to which year it was that electricity sales last peaked uh, in the United States. So this is national sales of electricity 
all utility companies. And I'll give people a few seconds to respond in the chat. We have a lot of good guesses and probably a few people who have seen this slide before in some of my presentations. It's one of my favorite questions. Um, but the year was in 2007. And so we've gone now almost a decade without a significant increase in uh, retail electricity sales. And there are a lot of drivers behind that. You know, as I mentioned before, we've got the technology, um, uh, whether it's solar or, you know, smart thermostats controlled by smartphones. I, you know, this is actually an image of my own phone and the app that I can use to manage my thermostat. Uh, at home, we have, you know, a lot of uh, state-based conservation programs, energy efficiency. We have LED light bulbs. Uh, and, and other technologies making it much easier to conserve energy. So a lot of things happening to the utility market, to the electricity market that utilities are having to confront at this time, not just this idea of customer-owned solar. Um, you also have utilities investing a lot more in, you know, in California in particular uh, in the transmission system, which is kind of at odds with the notion that we have a lot more, a lot more solutions available at the distributed level for solving uh, the issues of the grid and some lagging investment in the distribution system itself, uh, as much as $57 billion uh, of a gap in investment and distribution infrastructure uh, estimated by the American Society of Civil Engineers, which is remarkable given that that's kind of the level at which all of this innovative technology is likely to connect. And so when you put together all of these different factors, whether it's the cultural conservatism of utilities uh, or all of the technology threats that are happening at the retail level, what you find is um, a lot of uh, a lot of political battles uh, taking place across the country. So all of these states here flagged had some sort of action on distributed energy in the first quarter, just the first quarter of 2016 of this year, um, whether that was on net metering policy or other policies that impact distributed renewable energy. So there's a remarkable amount of activity taking place right now and many utilities trying to hold the line and defend their turf as a result of the potential economic impact for, you know, especially investor-owned utilities. And it also led to this magazine cover from Bloomberg Business looking at the competition and, you know, they construed it as the battle between two billionaires uh, fighting it out over um, who would dominate. But really Elon Musk sort of stands in for the distributed energy solutions. His company, Solar City, of course, the first and, and uh, to this date, the most successful uh, solar leasing company at, at aiding people at the distributed level to install solar, whereas Warren Buffett is a major investor in several monopoly, uh, vertically integrated electric companies. Uh, and so that competition continues, and Nevada was sort of ground zero for this, and, and, the, re and the reason why this issue rose to national prominence, of course, with the utility company there, NV Energy, also a Buffett uh, company, was able to uh, at least temporarily remove net metering uh, as well as doing it retroactively. Um, and so the <laughs> economies of scale discussion is not just happening in the vacuum of economists, but is happening in the very real uh, ring of politics over energy choices uh, with uh, the traditional energy companies uh, putting their stake in the ground. So there are a few ways that we can address this and, and talk about some new rules for the system that allow, uh, that sort of um, allow us to uh, compare and offer um, solutions uh, that aren't bound up in this traditional big versus small um, spectrum. You know, one is uh, things like microgrids that are tools that can both serve the larger grid in its, in its quest for resiliency and more efficiency, but also um, allowing for development of distributed energy solutions. And there are a number of different policy issues with those that we've addressed in a separate uh, report that you can see, but that uh, range from defining what a microgrid is in state law uh, to uh, enabling uh, easier interconnection requests to solving the technology problem of a plug and play control solution. Um, they're setting up markets. You know, there was a FERC a uh, decision just earlier this week looking at um, how we, or sorry, not earlier this week, but about a week or two ago, um, that will help open up markets to more distributed energy resources in the same way that they've done so with demand response and with other resources. So finding ways in which we can have more independent 
grid management that allows for these market solutions to compete at whatever level they want to compete at, whether that's large-scale wind, kind of at the 10 or 11 o'clock uh, uh, location on this graphic, um, or electric vehicles and solar and energy-efficient buildings, as we see at the 6 o'clock position. Um, or things like power sharing that allow you know, virtual net metering or other policies um, that can enable us to both capture some economies of scale but can enable these folks to produce power and, and deliver it to the system where it needs it most. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, try to address some of your many questions. I wasn't able to see all of them as I was going along due to the weird interface between my full screen presentation um, and, uh, uh, and the chat window. Um, we'll also be looking for more of your questions, uh, so I'll be scrolling uh, through all of them right now and trying to answer many of them. I uh, also want to encourage you to check out the report, which is on our website now, freely available. Uh, it's Bigger, Best in Renewable Energy. Uh, and thank you very much for taking the time to look today uh, this graphic here, just giving you a little sense of our broader work uh, on energy. You're welcome to follow along on Twitter if you participate there and also get all of our resources at ILSR.org.